Well, hello. It's Sunday afternoon, October 2nd, 2005, and time for the Money Show on the Genesis Communication Network, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. This is Harry Brown, and I'm here with my good friend John B. Chandler from Austin, Texas, and we're going to talk to you about money savings, um, investments, speculations, anything that has to do with money. That's the point of this show. And uh, you can ask questions, you can make comments, anything you like. You can do that by calling 1-800-259-9231 or emailing question at harrybrown.org. That's question at harrybrown.org or phoning us at 1-800-259-9231. Well, John, it's good to have you back this week, and uh, why don't you start us off with the first question that's come in during the week. Uh, Thank you, Harry. You recall last week I was broadcasting from an altitude of 8,900 feet in cool Colorado. Today I'm broadcasting from an altitude of 400 feet in hot Texas, and I'm awfully glad to be here with you this afternoon. Harry, this afternoon we have a number of questions. Uh, So after our long monologues of the last two programs, uh, we're going to have to hustle to get through all of these questions. So let's begin with a question from Bob. Sorry, I don't know where Bob's from, but wherever you're from, Bob, we're glad to hear from you. The question is, given that Bush has proposed, quote, whatever it takes to pay for Katrina, will you please explain to me how we will be better off if U.S. citizens' personal savings rates were positive and not negative? How does having billions of dollars in personal savings in the bank or banks help to mitigate the problem of the government responding to a disaster such as Katrina. Would would that help the government from the deficit spending related to this this disaster? And he adds a note, I don't believe the government should spend our money on disasters, but if we had lots of personal savings, would that help? No, it wouldn't, uh, as a matter of fact. The personal savings rate, uh, and we covered this partially last week, but let's uh, finish it off. Uh, the personal savings rate is the total of the money that people have put into investments and uh, bank accounts and so forth minus the total amount that people have borrowed. And you might think that that would come out to be uh, uh, equal because uh, you can only borrow what somebody has saved. But as a matter of fact, uh, it can be very positive or very negative based on how much foreign investment comes in and how much uh, foreign investment is made by Americans. And so you can have a positive rate or a negative rate, and it's been negative in the United States for many years. But it wouldn't matter if the banks were loaded with money uh, that just is waiting to be lent to somebody for the federal government to come in and borrow it because the fact of the matter is the federal government is going to borrow it. It's not a question of what the overall U.S. economy can handle. It is a question of what the U.S. government can handle. And if it borrows all this money from the banks to pay for Katrina and other things, uh, that's adding to the deficit. And we're going to have uh, an enormous deficit, the $300 billion that's already uh, scheduled for this fiscal year is the largest deficit the government has ever run, and obviously it's going to go up once they start borrowing more money for Katrina. And um, uh, so it doesn't really matter about the personal savings. Now, what happens if there aren't enough savings in the bank? Well, the government will just borrow it from foreign governments and foreign investors, uh, which it does. And that's not a bad thing that foreign investors and foreign governments make investments in the United States. It's a bad thing when our government is borrowing, obviously. We know that. But it's not a bad thing if those foreigners want to invest in the United States because you will always have people investing in foreign countries. So you will always have investments crossing uh, uh, borders. And um, when that happens, it is offset by people in the other country buying goods and services from uh, the country that's making the investments. In other words, when we have a negative trade deficit because we're buying more foreign goods than foreigners are buying from us, 
it is offset by foreigners actually putting money in the United States. They may be lending the money. They may be buying stocks. They may be doing a lot of things. But the balance of uh, payments always comes out equal because whatever people have in a negative trade balance, they will have in a positive investment balance, and those two will offset. And we could go into all the reasons that that's true, but it's not really necessary. It doesn't affect your investments that much. If somebody's really concerned about it, you might send a question, and we'll cover it in a future week. So uh, do you think that covers the uh, the question and the answer, John? Yes, I do. I have noted in the uh, last couple of months there have been new uh, data uh, reported that the personal savings has gone into the negative category. Uh, and it seems that uh, with easy credit, uh, our U.S. citizens have taken a uh, clue from our government and gone into a deficit spending mode. The difference is, is the government can create money, uh, whereas individual citizens uh, cannot. Yeah, you uh, have to earn it to pay it back. It is, it is not sustainable, and we should be very, very careful because, uh, and be careful to realize that easy credit uh, makes you uh, take uh, easy credit to buy things, uh, very easy to buy things that you cannot afford. Uh, but at some point, you're going to have to pay it back or you're going to be in trouble, whereas the U.S. government just can, can continue deficit spending uh, for who knows how long. Neither one of them are sustainable, I don't think, Harry, but the government can certainly sustain it longer than individual citizens. For sure. Wouldn't you say? Uh, definitely. All right. Well, I think that covers it as far as I'm concerned. I hope it covers it as far as Bob is concerned. If not, Bob, uh, send us another question or comment, and we'll be happy to try to uh, answer it to a more in-depth degree at a later time. Next, Harry, uh, we have a question from Warren. Again, I'm sorry, Warren, I don't know where you are from either, but we're certainly happy to hear from you too. Uh, Warren's question is following. Do you have any recommendations for the variable portfolio at the present time? The permanent portfolio is straightforward, very important, and has a good long-term record. Your frequent listeners are already quite familiar with it. It would be stimulating each session to have some time devoted to speculative possibilities. Is this a viable idea? Warren. Well, I think it is, but I personally have uh, not taken an interest in speculating for several years now, and uh, so I have no recommendations of my own, but from time to time we can have guests on who deal more in uh, speculative investments. And I think while I was gone, John, didn't you interview either Rick Mayberry or Doug Casey? Uh, I interviewed both uh, Rick Mayberry and uh, Adrian Day. Doug Casey I couldn't find. He was at some other corner of the world, as he usually is. Yes. Uh, so uh, those people deal uh, almost entirely in speculations, and so from time to time we might do that. And uh, I'll look around uh, for possible guests who can do that. And when we come back, I'll explain this idea of the variable portfolio because uh, I think uh, many, many listeners may not even know what we're talking about here. But in the meantime, we're going to hear some messages from uh, some important sponsors. And uh, we'll be right back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. This is Harry Brennan with John Chandler. The phone number here is 1-800-259-9231, or you can email us, question at harrybrown.org, question at harrybrown.org. Uh, all right, uh, John, where were we? We were just getting ready to explain the nature of the variable portfolio, uh, what it is and how it works and how you can use the variable portfolio if you use the right strategy to invest, to, uh, invest safely. All right. We uh, talked about this, uh, about the permanent portfolio uh, on and on ad infinitum on this show as what you should be doing with the money you 
cannot afford to lose, the money that's precious to you, the money that you need for your children's education, for your own retirement, whatever it may be, it is the safest, most stable, simplest way I know of to take care of the future, whatever it may bring. Now, once you've done that, if you have some additional money left over that you can afford to lose and you would like to speculate, you would like to take a flyer to see if you can run $5,000 into $20,000 or 10000 into fifty, or whatever it may be, then I suggest that you set up a second portfolio, which I call the variable portfolio. Now, the names are significant because the permanent portfolio is permanent. Once you set it up, you never change the percentages in it, the allocation to the different investments. The variable portfolio is variable. You do with it whatever you feel like at the time. You might have it 100% in gold. You might have it 50% in stocks and 50% in cash. You, you, you do whatever you think best. And you are speculating with it, trying to beat the market, trying to beat the return that's available to other people. And uh, that's why it's called the variable portfolio. Now, uh, we can talk a little about the strategies that can be used in the variable portfolio, but I want to emphasize that while there are very strict rules about the permanent portfolio, there really are no rules about the variable portfolio in that you can follow anybody's strategy that you want. Uh, you can use uh, moving averages. You can do various different things with it, knowing that if you lose this money, it is not going to affect your plans for the future. It's like going to Las Vegas and setting aside uh, $500 and say, I'm going to play blackjack with this $500. If I lose the $500, i will quit, but I will not have hurt myself because I know I can afford the $500. Uh, I'm going to do that instead of going to some shows or some other things. And uh, so you have already set aside a strict amount of money that you know you can afford to lose. And that's the same thing with the, the variable portfolio. And uh, Warren says, why don't we, uh, from time to time, offer some recommendations? And uh, I think that that's not a bad idea just to add a little variety to this show. But those recommendations, I think, are going to have to come from guests rather than from me. I used to love to speculate. Uh, when I was younger, but I'm getting on in years. I'm, I'm going to be 30 years old next month. Well, no, wait a second. Uh, that's somebody else. All right. Uh, where are we, John? We're talking about uh, no rules with the uh, variable portfolio. However, uh, in the past, you've given what I thought were some very, very good guidelines with regard to giving some thought to the risk-reward ratio as well as uh, using uh, uh, stop losses with your speculations and managing your money through risk-reward ratio and stop losses is as important as any I know of in speculating uh, safely and properly. So you might elaborate a little bit on risk-reward ratio and uh, stop losses. Yeah, I, I believe that if you're going to speculate, you should really be, in effect, going for broke. In other words, you don't want to speculate in order to try to make a 10% return on your uh, speculative investment. Uh, what you should look for are long shots. And Doug Casey uses the approach of betting on five or ten different gold stocks, for instance, knowing that some, some of those are just simply going to wash out. They're going to turn out to be dry holes, uh, if I may mix my metaphors. And uh, so be it, but that in among those, there are going to be one or two that are going to produce 10-for-one returns, and they're going to not only uh, offset the losses in the others, but they're going to leave you with a large gain overall. And I think that makes sense to a certain extent, uh, but you don't have to necessarily uh, speculate with 10 or, or more uh, different uh, gold stocks or oil stocks or whatever it may be, uh, you can just pick uh, two or three that you think are, are real uh, possibilities. But what you should be doing is going for a big return uh, because you're probably risking all uh, or a good deal of whatever it is you put into this. And so the reward 
reward should be very, very great if you're risking most of what you have. In other words, if you win, if it turns out you're right with your speculation, uh, you're going to make 300% or 500% or maybe even more on it rather than just uh, a 20% gain. And um, uh, as far as the stock losses are concerned, I think it's important to limit your loss also. And that means that you don't want to take a chance on losing the entire investment. And a stop loss is simply a device whereby you tell the broker that if the price drops on your investment to a certain level, that he automatically will go ahead and sell it. He doesn't consult you. He doesn't give you a chance to let your emotions take over. He doesn't uh, ask you to agonize over this now at this moment of crisis and decide whether you're going to hang on for another 10% down or another 20% down. Rather, he just simply goes ahead and sells uh, the investment, and you're out of it at that point. Now, the investment may return and come up, and you'll think, oh, I wish I hadn't had that stop loss. But in the long run, you will be far, far better off with these automatic sales that take place rather than putting yourself in a position of having to agonize over this when the moment of truth comes. So, uh, in effect, I think that stop losses are a very important part of the strategy, at least the strategy that I use. They help to limit the loss, and at the same time, on the other side of the equation, I'm going for a big gain. And you may decide otherwise, but I found this to be very, very helpful, and I found that in the long run, with my variable portfolio investments, I came out ahead. And, Harry, uh, you used to uh, say, and I believe you still believe, that it's extremely important to place that stop loss in at the exact same time you make the investment. You should figure out uh, when you will recognize or when you will know that you've made a mistake. Put the stop loss in at that point. Uh, at the same time you make the investment, because as soon as you make that investment, you become emotionally involved and you get involved with wishful thinking and if I could I should have would I'd be the heavyweight champion of the world type thinking so uh, I presume you would still agree with uh, that general philosophy yes very definitely the stop loss should be entered at the very time that you make the investment because at the time you make the investment you should be considering what kind of a reward possibility you have here and you should also be considering at that same time, when should I get out? When do I decide that this was a mistake? And you decide that when you make the investment, not at some time later, because once the investment is there, you now have an emotional interest in it, and that's when you should not be making decisions. And, Harry, over the, oh, 20 or so years, we were publishing uh, Harry Brown's special reports and we used to get uh, tons of mail in, one of the most common questions that we had was, uh, to buy the permanent portfolio idea, I buy the variable portfolio idea, but please tell me, how do you figure out how much should be in one and how much should be in the other? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, and it's not uh, an easy question to answer in the sense that there's some formula uh, that you can apply to your own situation. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler, and I uh, apologize, I must, for uh, the way we went off to the break just now. We had a little glitch in our computer that uh, takes care of uh, keeping track of everything. But uh, we're here now, and we're not going away. And we were talking about how you separate your funds between the permanent portfolio and the variable portfolio. And the first thing that I must say is you don't have to have a variable portfolio. You should have one only if you want to speculate. There's no reason uh, that you must. It's not part of the strategy or the philosophy that you must have two portfolios. The most important thing is that you have a permanent portfolio. And then if you have some money left over and you enjoy speculating, then have a variable portfolio. Now, how much should go in the variable portfolio? The best way to approach this that I know is to pick a number that makes sense to you. Pick a figure like $20,000 or $40,000 or $5,000 or whatever makes sense for your situation. 
and sit down in an easy chair and just close your eyes. Don't go to sleep, but close your eyes and just think what might happen if you lost that amount, the 20000 or whatever it is. Uh, how would you feel? And just see how that makes you feel uh, losing that much money. Now, if it doesn't bother you at all, you know you have not put too much in the variable portfolio. But if it does, then you know you have put too much and you've got to start over again with a smaller figure and see how that makes you feel. And you keep doing this until you reach a point where you have picked a figure that does not bother you emotionally if you were to lose it and not make you feel like, oh, my God, I won't be able to do this or that or whatever it is. And yet if you up it by another couple of percent or whatever it is, it does make you concerned, and you know you finally reach the figure that should go in the variable portfolio. Now, as I said, this is not a scientific way of going about it. It's not a perfect formula, but it's the one way I know to try to get a handle on this and decide what would be a workable figure for the variable portfolio. Harry, I remember one time you suggested to a client that I uh, get up uh, the next morning and pile all of his investment assets on the kitchen on the kitchen table, but without regard to how much he paid for them or how much they were uh, up or down. But just pile all the investment assets on the kitchen table and look at them and try to decide how much of those that those assets he could lose without it ruining his life without it changing his lifestyle, how much he could lose without it tying his stomach into a knot. And that amount was the amount that uh, could fit safely into a variable portfolio. So that's another example, another way to look at it. Uh, it's the same, the same thing, but it's a different uh, uh, idea about how to go about doing it. But I think the point is uh, well taken and well made. So uh, unless you have something else to add, uh, we can move on, Harry, to our very next question. Good. Uh, next question comes from Tom. Tom, right, Harry, I was wondering if you have heard of the Liberty Dollar, and if so, what do you think about it? I'm not sure why this is better than just buying silver or gold. And why would you pay $10 for a one-ounce silver coin we need to buy silver eagles for less. Well, that is a good question. Uh, and I only received this question this morning and didn't have time to do uh, extensive uh, research, but I did have an opportunity to call uh, two uh, coin and gold dealers that I know and have known for 25 or 30 years, uh, one of whom is a... Uh, Lifetime member of the Professional Numismatic Guild. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Numismatic Guild, and has uh, he's actually known as the coin dealer to coin dealers in the uh, south southwest part of the country. And I posed this question to both of them because I had, in fact, heard of the Liberty Dollar, but I wasn't quite sure that what I heard was correct. So I'm going to tell you what I heard this morning. Uh, can't verify it, so take it with a little bit of grain of salt. But uh, I'd bet at least a cheeseburger on, and a malt uh, that was correct. And we'll do a little research, and if it's incorrect, uh, we'll correct it next weekend. Right, and if anybody listening knows something uh, uh, to augment this, then uh, feel free to let us know, call or email us. The story I received is that uh, the Liberty Dollar is a coin or token that's issued by a private company. And the claim to fame here is that they promise to buy back the coin at $10 no matter what the price of silver is. So if you buy the coin at $10 and silver goes down, uh, you have a promise that they will buy it back for ten dollars, and uh, you uh, therefore uh, cannot possibly lose money. And uh, that sounds like a very, very good idea. Uh, but at this point, I will remind you of a quote that I gave a few weeks ago on this program, and the quote is from 
a old economics professor at Georgia Tech. Incidentally, I did not go to Georgia Tech. I was having a dinner and a long discussion with this uh, economics professor. And during that discussion, he said, John, it's not the right to collect, but the proceeds from the right to collect, which decorates the mahogany. Meaning, of course, that any uh, promise or guarantee, uh, you have to look at what stands behind the promise or guarantee. It's not just the guarantee that matters. It's not the guarantee that uh, decorates the mahogany. Uh, it is the proceeds from the guarantee which would decorate the mahogany. And here we have a question of private company, uh, if my information is correct, uh, which is selling this uh, Liberty Dollar for $10, and they're promising or guaranteeing uh, that if silver goes down, uh, they will repay you $10 uh, regardless, uh, which sounds like a very, very good deal. Uh, incidentally, one of the code coin dealers uh, told me that they uh, he bought uh, 100 of them uh, a while back, uh, when silver was about $7.50 an ounce, and he decided he would uh, test it and see if he could send them in. Uh, so he called, and they said, sure, we'll buy them back for $10. Uh, so he wrapped them up and sent them in, and a month or two later, he actually got his money. Did he pay $10 for each one? No, he paid uh, the spot price of silver uh, by the at the time, seven fifty or whatever. Yes, yes. Uh, so he paid uh, less. He paid the spot price minus the bid ask on spot, and uh, so he sent them in and he received his ten dollars. But he said did say that it took a month or two to get his money. And uh, even though they said they would pay, uh, he became a little worried, but and was relieved when he got the money back. So we'll finish up this discussion uh, quickly when we come back from the break. Uh, then we'll deal with another question, so we hope you'll stay tuned. This is John Chandler, Harry Brown sidekick on The Money Show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after these few commercials. To the Money Show. Uh, this is John Chandler with Harry Brown on the Money Show this afternoon. We're happy to have you here. Uh, we were just finishing up a discussion about the Liberty Dollar, uh, and I would only add to what I've already said that this goes, uh, the Liberty Dollar goes for any uh, promise or guarantee. And the problem is, how do you know that the person who's making the promise or the guarantee is going to be able to satisfy it? Well, it's very, very difficult. Uh, in fact, it's uh, almost impossible to know for sure. So any time you accept a promise or accept a guarantee, uh, you know that uh, you're taking a bit of a risk. And I think that's the case with the Liberty Dollar. The question I had was, okay, suppose silver goes down to $4 an ounce, and everybody in the world who's bought the Liberty Dollar uh, sends in their dollars to get $10. Will this company have enough money to pay the promise? Uh, will they uh, pay it? Who knows? Uh, I certainly don't know, uh, but they guarantee it and make a promise, and if you're willing to take the risk of that promise, uh, be uh, my guest. Uh, Harry, I understand that uh, after... Uh, during the break or somewhere along the line, we've received a couple of questions uh, this afternoon from listeners, uh, and uh, I don't have those questions, so if you would, uh, why don't we uh, take those, since we know those people are listening, and see if we can handle those uh, quickly while we still have some time. Sure. Um, Bob out in cyberspace uh, asks, what combination of events were in effect when the permanent portfolio produced the loss? Well, over the last 35 years, the permanent portfolio has had only four losing years, and it has averaged a gain of 9% uh, for all of the 35 years. Now, the worst year that it had was in 1981 when it lost 6%, and the reason it lost 6% was because that year everything went down. Gold went down, stocks went down, bonds went down, uh, commodities, currencies, everything went down. 
But, of course, that's a situation that cannot sustain itself. Uh, it's a recessionary situation. And the following year, 1982, everything went up and really sprang up. Gold uh, had a big gain. Stocks had a big gain. Bonds even moved up a bit. And the result was that the portfolio gained something like 22%. I don't have the figures in front of me, but it was over 20%. And that was as unusual as the 6% loss was the year before. So given the two years, there was a net gain, a, a quite a big net gain, bigger than we should expect in an average year with a permanent portfolio. But that's the only time that I know when you really had uh, an inundation of losses in all of the investments. And otherwise, we always have at least one winning investment that's strong enough to pull the portfolio upward. And uh, so I hope that answers the question. It does, Harry. Uh, I would like to add one thing, though, and that is the world doesn't really work according to the calendar. Uh, the calendar is there for, I think, maybe the benefit of accountants. And uh, to remember our birthdays. Well, something of that nature. A lot of, lot of harm has been done because of the calendar. Uh, and one of the harms is trying to make everything fit neatly into a 12 month or four week or seven day pattern. Uh, the idea of the permanent portfolio is, is it invests in, uh, asset classes which respond differently in different economic conditions. The economic conditions that makes one thing goes down uh, is the same condition that makes another asset go up. But here is the key, and that is it does not happen overnight. Uh, it does take time for these economic forces to uh, uh, take hold. And I remember back during the 70s, early 80s, when we were doing research on the uh, permanent portfolio, uh, we found periods as long as 18 months where the... Uh, uh, for the portfolio, uh, could lose money. Uh, but uh, that was about the longest we found. Now, bear in mind, this is not a promise. It's not a guarantee. We're not saying that uh, only 18 months can work. I can just say, simply say, during the periods when uh, it was being tested, uh, the prices uh, doing tests on the uh, permanent portfolio and what would happen in different situations over long, long, long periods of time, about 18 months is the maximum we found where the portfolio uh, could lose money before the economic forces took hold and balanced the portfolio out. Yes. Uh, in other words, if you uh, were to invest on day one, uh, you did run the risk that maybe you would not show a gain for 18 months. But uh, as you say, that was uh, a unique situation, an unusual situation, but it was a possibility and it must be recognized. But in any event, um, uh, we know that the portfolio does write itself and it doesn't take very long. That's the, the value of the stability. Uh, you look at a, a chart of the stock market and you see these roller coaster swings, uh, but you don't see that in a chart of the permanent portfolio, and you can see that at my website. You can uh, get to a chart of the permanent portfolio, and you just see the slow, steady growth. Stability is very important because if it's not stable, you're going to be tempted to abandon the whole approach and probably at the worst time. All right, we'll continue with um, a couple more questions when we come back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. Stay tuned. This is The Money Show brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds at 1-800-531-5142. Hello again, I'm John Chandler along with Harry Brown for The Money Show this afternoon. Boy, this hour has moved along very rapidly. Harry, we're going to have to hustle to get through uh, the next question, which comes from Jane. Uh, Jane asks, or says, Dear Harry, I listen to your show as much as time allows me. I have another question concerning your discussion uh, on rental real estate. If we are set to have inflation, if people are not going to be able to afford new mortgages, and many perhaps even losing their homes as per their inability to make their high monthly payments, where are these people going to live? Will there not be an increased demand for rentals? 
I'm a believer in your balanced portfolio system as well as read many of your books. Thanks again. Love your show, Jay. Uh, Harry, you have any immediate thoughts on that? If not, uh, I can uh, add a little bit. Go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, one of the best ways to answer this question would be to explain the strategy of a very uh, close and successful real estate in, uh, investor friend of mine. Uh, his strategy was to buy uh, rental uh, uh, houses, uh, but very inexpensive rental houses, rental houses that he would not live in, nor did most of the people he know would live in, uh, but they were inexpensive rental houses. And his uh, theory was, with by having these inexpensive rental houses, uh, if times were good, he would catch people moving up from apartments and wanting to move into a home or a house. Uh, and when times were bad, he would catch people who couldn't pay their mortgages and losing their houses and were moving down to uh, uh, more affordable living. Mm-hmm. Well, that would, that would apply in almost any economic environment except maybe prosperity and wouldn't necessarily be tied to inflation. Uh, the only thing I would add is that during the 70s and early 80s when we had terrible inflation, the value of those uh, the uh, rental income was very, very small compared to the value of the houses. The inflation was driving uh, the market value of the, the house is way up. So it should have a $100,000 house that was producing only maybe $4,000 or $3,000 in uh, rental income per year. And uh, the rental income just didn't keep up with the inflation. But, um, uh, you know, I really don't have a specific answer to it. I think what you said uh, makes sense and that that's one way of looking at it under any circumstances. And I see that we are just about out of time, so let me take this opportunity to thank John Harmon in Burnsville, uh, Minnesota, who kept us on the air for almost the entire hour. <laughs> and, uh, uh, also, I want to thank our sponsors, and particularly the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, which uh, sponsors this in part and which you can reach by going to permanentportfolio.com or calling 1-800-531-5142. But most of all, I want to thank you for tuning in, and I hope you will come back next week. John Chandler and Harry Brown invite you to do so, and hope you do so, and we hope you have a very, very good week. Bye now. 